Hi everyone, thanks for watching. You can support our work on our website ageoftruth.tv and please like our videos, subscribe to our channels on YouTube, BitChute and Brideon and remember to hit the bell for notifications and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. To be sure not to miss any of our shows, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website ageoftruth.tv Hi, John. You devil. You're a devil. <laughs> Here we devil are again. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but you can see you can see that I'm an angel in my eyes. Yeah, the eyes give you away. Yeah, I the get eyes it. give you away, but I can't see yours. That's the tradition here, huh, John? Oh, there they are. I can see them a little bit, huh? Yeah. I'll tell you a story about that, which might be a good way to begin. Hello and welcome to this edition of Age of Truth TV. I'm Lucas Alexander in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's June 2023 and we're thrilled to welcome a guest, a special guest who has been with us before. We did an explosive, fascinating and controversial episode with him previously on this channel. And I'm sure that this episode two will be just as eye-opening as the first one. He is an American Gnostic, a telestic shaman, a mystery school scholar, a researcher and lecturer, and the author of the highly acclaimed book, Not in His Image. He is one of the great interpreters of the Gnostic Gospels found in the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt in 1945. We're happy to welcome back on Age of Truth TV, John Lamb Lash. a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. Good evening from Copenhagen, Denmark, and welcome to this Age of Truth TV special. Please subscribe to our channel, like our videos, and hit the bell for notifications. We are thrilled to introduce our guest tonight. He has been with us before. We did an episode one that was very provocative, very in-depth, very eye-opening, and I'm sure that this episode two will be just as controversial and fascinating because our guest is the great JLL, that stranger who stalks your sanity, that wordsmith provocateur who invades your mind with thoughts of wonder and inconvenient wisdom if you dare to actually listen. He is no lamb, but he is certainly lashing out to connect with your understanding and your inner standing. Dear John Lamb Lash, welcome once more on Age of Truth TV. My honorable friend, Lucas, glad to be back with you. It has been a long time. I see you caught my new meme. You know, hey there, say there, stranger. Do you remember me? I'm that stranger who stalks your sanity. That's my new meme. If I do, and you can hear that I've been listening. I'm, huh? I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna start with that. But it's been so long, man, and time is going so fast. What in the hell is going on in this world? Unbelievable. Even this day just went like this. It's like, you know, the rotation, the frequency circle is just going faster and faster. And 24 hours is not 24 hours anymore. It's like it just, it's, you know, 
a blink of an eye oh then and then that day is gone it's unbelievable we covered so much in our first discussion and people can watch that on our channel it was totally fascinating it was really wild and outrageous and in-depth and of course people know you as a gnostic a telestic shaman an author researcher and lecturer a mystery school scholar and one of the great interpreters of the gnostic gospels uh, found in um, the Nagamadi Library in Egypt in 1945. So all of what we covered before, and I don't remember all, people can watch that. But when you left us the last time, you there was a very, very uh, delicate uh, topic that we ended on there. It was, oh my God, it was a very touchy situation. Um, what you said was rather startling to a lot of people, a lot of people watching it. The concept of hate and how to use the that concept of hate and hate as a source of energy, a tool. And boy, have we waited a long time, way too long, I have to say, to, to uh, have the continuation from you. And uh, I think we should go into it because... You know, you talk about hate, you talk about anger. How can we use that? What is, it's very controversial as you are. So take it away. Excellent. I'm really happy that you're bringing it back to that topic to me, which is a topic of extreme significance and having the courage to face it, just to look at it and say, well, okay, I don't, reject hate and I don't reject anger because I don't, I don't like to feel that way and I think they're bad things and you're a bad person if you feel them it's kind of just set that aside and let's see if we can take a few steps back and uh maybe take a new perspective on it and that's what we're going to do in this talk but uh goddess uh, you know bear with me she is my girlfriend, so she's pretty tolerant. Um, <laughs> oh, really? God, God is there with me, but uh, we're going to get there. And may I do it in sort of a roundabout fashion? You recall that I proposed to you that the subject of this talk conversation might be mutation. You know? I propose that there is a mutation happening of the human species currently. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that this mutation has a lot to do with those issues of owning anger, owning hatred, and so forth. So I've been reflecting a lot on how we're going to uh, navigate through this conversation <clears throat> and to be honest with you, may I be honest? <laughs> oh, the, we are. This is age of truth. You have to be honest, please. You know, if I'm, I'm obligated, it, okay. That, so, and me. I know, and I know, we're going to talk about AI and a lot of things that are going on in the world today. And therefore, I think when we start here with you talking about hate and cruelty and aggression and how to use that, what I mean, how, how would you define using that as a, as a as an energy source versus morality and empathy and compassion? Well, it all goes back to this meme that I love to use, which is a Toltec word, which is Olin, O-L-L-I-N. And have you ever seen the, the image of the Aztec calendar stone, the big Aztec calendar stone? Many people have seen it. Yes, and it I has have seen elaborate that. engravings. And in the center, it has a face with a tongue sticking out, like in the Rolling Stones album of the I don't, you're not old enough to remember that, but I am, okay? <laughs> I know the Rolling Stones, definitely. I, I've been to see their shows. <laughs> with, with the tongue hanging out, right? The lolling tongue. So this as well, They were already stone. aging when I started going to their shows, but I mean, the tongue was still there. <laughs> Fair enough. It's a powerful meme, this lolling tongue. We talk about what that means, but the... Aztec calendar stone is a calendar 
and it records the Aztec system of car chronology, which I've compared to the Hindu system, Chinese, Egyptian. You know, I've done a lot of work on these, <laughs> excuse me, ancient chronologies. And it describes what they call the five ages or the five suns. So according to the Aztec Toltec chronology, we're now living in the fifth sun, which I equate with Kali Yuga, the fifth sun. And the word for the fifth sun is Olin. And what it means is, they say it means earthquake or turbulent movement, turbulent eruption. So the notion is that our age will end in a turbulent eruption and possibly earthquakes, possibly massive earth changes, things of that sort, right? You follow the drift here. The wonderful thing about the word Olin is that it also means heartbeat. And so the way I read it is, yeah, okay, who can say we're not in a moment of enormous turbulence? And part of that turbulence is degeneration and insanity. But there's another part of the turbulence that is wonder, beauty, sanity, and an eruption of wisdom from the innate capacities of the human animal, wisdom that has been denied and suppressed for centuries. So we're living in this moment of Olin. And as I've said in some of the talks I did on, uh, on my YouTube channel, it's about a change of heart. Everything depends on a change of heart. So it's one thing to say, uh, oh, I'm a human being, I'm a human animal, as I like to say, because we are animals. And, well, what is humanity? Well, what... What but F is humanity, okay? What is it? It's two things, my friend. It's a biological definition. The human species equals humanity, right? But it's also a moral and emotional definition, isn't it? It's like when you say of someone, oh, he or she lacks humanity. They don't have humanity. Well, what are you actually saying? What, what, you know, that saying doesn't mean anything. So humanity is a biological definition, but it's also a moral and emotional value system. So we learn customarily that humanity, to be humane, to be truly human, you have to have these attributes and these behaviors, right? So it's, that we're not animals it, and that, that we're not predators in the same way, even though we possess those um, emotions and those th those attributes or those, uh, yeah, I don't know what you actually call them, those bad sides to our personality. Hey, come on. We're the biggest predator on the planet. You know, if you, I've often pointed this out. If you look at beautiful predatory animals, like lions, tigers, cougars. I, I adore these animals. They're exquisitely beautiful. Or you, you look at like the raptor birds, like the owl, the falcon. These are the predatory animals in nature, non-human. And what you find about them is that the wisdom goddess, in the way that she has arranged this beautiful, divine, Edenic laboratory in which we live, which we call the biosphere, She's arranged it so that those predators have a narrow margin of predation. For instance, did you know that a female uh, cheetah, which is the fastest animal in the world, can run 75 miles an hour, when she goes out to get food uh, for her children, she has four runs, and she can lose a quarter of her weight in these four runs she can become so exhausted. And what is she seeking to prey on? A very select section of other animals. But the human animal preys on everything and we even prey upon our own species. And this is a special condition that needs to be looked at with brutal honesty. It's time that we start facing this 
And that is part of the olin and the change of heart. So if I don't get any other message across this evening, I'd like to be able to, to deliver something about uh, changing your sense of humanity. I want to change your sense of humanity. I do. I, I admit it. <laughs> I, I'm completely open-handed about it, okay? Why do I want to do that? I do it out of the perception that I have that there is an enormous mutation taking place on this planet, mutation of our species. And if, the, if this mutation has two arcs, one arc is that we're in a period of enormous degeneration and people are mutating in a degenerative way. Their humanity is degenerating. Their sexuality is degenerating. Their common sense is degenerating. So there's a massive descending wave of mutation. But hasn't that, all, hasn't that always, at all times in history, been degenerated? I mean, sexuality. If we go back in history, my God, the sexual predators and, and how perverse uh, everybody was in the past. Now they're just putting different faces on it. And also what they di did in the past, in the in the, during the, the the medieval times and and the Middle Ages and what they haven't done in the name of religion in order to cause pain, suffering and terror on other humans. Right. I've talked about that a lot and on his image, as you know. I've talked about the uh, perversion of sexuality and the innate moral sense of the human animal through religion and religious ideology. That's all fairly recent. You know, that comes about uh, since the inauguration of Judaism. You know, it began in Judaism, as I describe in his image, all this ideological repression of sex and pleasure you know, but there were we lived for tens of thousands of years before that. We didn't have that then. But the old Greeks and the old Romans, they used to, let's just say, corpulate, not just with uh, members of the uh, opposite sex, but also uh, quite young members of their own sex. Huh? That's what history tells us. There are yeah, but it doesn't say, sure, that behavior existed, but it doesn't say that it was a social program that's being shoved in your face every day. No, that that was a different thing, but people, did, they probably didn't even talk about it. It wasn't an issue. It hadn't been suppressed uh, for, for hundreds of years, which of course, uh, variations of sexuality has in this day and age. And now everything is coming to the surface and people are going a bit overboard, that's for sure. And it's become a political agenda like everything else. We're, we are having shoved down our throats these days. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. But when you look at it from a historic point, it's all been there. It's just been suppressed. Huh? No, it hasn't all been there to the degree and the extent that it is today. It is a matter of fact that they did discuss in ancient Athens. There was an open discussion about what they called pederastery. Okay? Pederastery means the, uh, and pedagogy means the education of children, of young boys. There was an open discussion, and I can guarantee you, because I've looked into it, that the uh, majority opinion of society and of the Greek intellectuals of that time, if you want to call them that, Plato, Socrates, all those people, I said, this is not the way to go. This is not hygienically correct. So my argument would be that in the past, sure, all these aberrations have existed in one form or another, but today there's a whole agenda to make them global prerogatives. That has never happened before. That has never happened before, for, for sure. And also the media and the, and the political propaganda collectively, uh, globally, if you will, uh, is, is totally different from the past. But what I just uh, referred to was the ancient Greek, Greeks, uh, the Greek civilization, the Romans as well. They did that. And we don't know how young those boys supposedly were. I mean, when you look <clears throat> into it, they were probably pretty young and they called these men their mentors, right? Yeah. And then they, they went on to become adults and then they probably right. did the same. 
they had particular language. They called them the Araskes. And that phenomena existed. If you want to read about it, read Greek Homosexuality by R.K. Dover. It's the best book that's ever been written about it. But my point is that I have looked at the situation of what I would call pagan sexuality, pagan sexual morals, sexual and social morals. And I've looked at the Roman and the Greek, and they had a very healthy and sane sexual life. This behavior that you're talking about was a tiny, tiny minority within that, you see? But the general sexual attitudes of people in ancient times, uh, who are people who are especially who are oriented to the goddess, was much more healthy and much more sane. And they knew how to party in a good way, erotically and sexually. See, the degeneracy of today is we don't have any genuine erotic culture. You know, we have trash. We have Miley Cyrus. We don't have genuine erotic culture, erotic beauty. Does anyone even know, listen to me, you know, what is genuine erotic beauty? What is it? Have you ever seen it? Huh? Well, see, it, I think it's uh, I think it's in the um, in the eye of the beholder and people have everybody has different well perversions or different sexu different sexuality or things they don't well disclose or talk to people about. It doesn't even have to be that perverted or that different and that criminal like say if you're into children and all of those things that we of course expose a lot on this show about what the satanists are doing and all of that but i mean everybody has a different view and a different understanding of what they're attracted to but i mean in the past 50 60 years we've had playboy and hugh hefner and all of those things when the the poor the the, the age of pornography uh became uh the big thing obviously huh well, when you say everybody, I accept the term, but it excludes me. <laughs> I don't have any perversions, none whatsoever. Excuse well, me. really, one wouldn't think just by looking at you. I know, but looks can be deceptive. I know. I know all Listen, about that. I am, I am jaded, but I'm not decadent. Mark the difference well. But don't you think everybody has a decadent side? I mean, that's not bad is it if it if you're doing certain acts with somebody who agrees with you who wants to do it of their own volition and if you're two adults doing it i mean if it doesn't hurt anybody else what's the problem we're not now i'm not talking about what's what is going on in the media and the clear political agenda that we are facing every day which is of course horrific and that goes for ev basically everything that we see in the media everything Look, uh, I can't really respond. I mean, you want to do it? You want to do a conversation on pornography and sexuality? I'm up for it, but that's not this conversation, okay? No, I don't okay. think we should do a, um, a conversation about that. But it's part of what we're talking about, and uh, we <clears throat> we can go back to where we started here. The energy source of hate and cruelty and aggression, which you dished out the last time you were on here and uh, and that that um energy that frequency of hate how do you think that can possibly in any way be a good thing and be used for good well i think first of all that when you ask that question it's a fair and honest question and it's like you and i are sitting on a stage right and you're sitting in this chair, I'm sitting here, and you ask me that question. And I would say to you, well, look, Lucas, behind us, behind the stage, there's a huge mass of scenery. And in order for me to answer your question accurately, we have to remove all that scenery. We have to remove all the assumptions of what it means to be human. There has to be a change of heart in your sense of humanity. If you think that where did you get your sense of humanity from in the first place? Who told you what it means to be human? Who told you that it's better, you're a better person if you're empathetic and kind and tolerant than if you're hateful and angry? Who told you you were a better person? 
Well, that should be something clearly that every human who who possess the ability to be an empath and be empathetic know is is the best way immediately. You feel that if you do a good deed, if you're warm hearted, if you're loving to somebody, you'll be rewarded in that way. And it no, you won't. You no, you won't. No, you won't. Oh, no, you won't. Not if they're a psychopath, not if they're a narcissistic psychopath. They won't respond to empathy. They don't have empathy themselves. Absolutely so right. But not hopefully, luckily, not everybody on this planet are uh, psychopaths and sociopaths. Maybe only those at the top, huh? Well, in 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 consideration of the great, very great possibility, which I think for which there's a great deal of evidence that it is these sociopaths and psychopaths who are in leading positions in our society, then it raises a serious question. What is the point of expressing empathy and love to people who do not receive it and will not be changed by it? Don't you think the frequency of love and the frequency of goodness can overthrow and and actually maybe um, put balance into this darkness? Isn't that Absolutely what we're not? Absolutely isn't that not, my friend. Oh. And I'm happy to disagree with you because I know that we can disagree and that generates our conversation. I couldn't disagree with you more. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Huh? Love is not the solution to our situation. I'll tell you what my objection to the pleading for love is. I call it the pleading for love, the pleading for empathy. Here's my objection. In the first place, who hears this plea? Two sorts of people. The people who are already convinced that love is good, that love makes a difference, that love matters and they want to be loving, don't need to be persuaded by that argument. And the people who are not persuaded by that argument will never be. They will never be persuaded by the argument of love. So it's a futile argument. I do not plead for love. I don't. It's a waste of time. Is that because you haven't experienced love in the way that uh, would be preferable for you and a lot of people have experienced? Or what is your take on it? I mean, everything is law of attraction, isn't it? What you send out. No, it is not. Project. It's the law of conduction. Conduction, not attraction. Law of manifestation, then. You are a devil in disguise. This is why I'm here on this platform talking to you. You asked me, have I had any experience of love? Right? You know, it, am I talking this way because I haven't had an experience of love? Well, I'm really a, an angel in disguise. That's really who I am. <laughs> but well, who are you? But who are you, my dear, behind the sunglasses? I'm the Nahual. I'm the unknown looking in your face. On the unknown coming to you, the unknown. And I'll say this about love. When you asked me about my personal experience, I talked about it. There's a clip on YouTube, a video called The First Cut is the Deepest. Now, I don't hide anything. I am completely transparent. And in that talk, I talked about the first time that I met someone that I loved. The first cut is the deepest, pal. You can believe it. And then I talked in that particular context about Jan Kerouac, Jan Michelle Kerouac. And that was a personal, individual love, you know, between a young girl and a young man. But what I want to talk about here in the, in the consistent with the meme of Olin, if you don't mind, is love for humanity. And I wanted to ask you, I thought, okay, we're going to have this conversation. I want to ask Lucas, uh, do you feel love for humanity? I feel great love for humanity because it's also a beautiful place to be. I also love and enjoy life. And I try to do the very, very best I can every day to find mm -hmm. something positive and to have a great time to select a wonderful, uh, let's say, almost, if I can say it poetically, a bouquet of great friends that, I've, that I'm connected to and I connect with. 
and try to uh, to eliminate uh, the bad energies and the negative people. We've all had those in our lives. And I guess if you're really open and open-minded, you will attract that as well. But you can be a little sharper about it and cut away all the crap. And I try to do that uh, as much as I can. Uh, I also know that we can be captured and trapped in negativity by looking at what we are always talking about on this channel, for example, which we, we've done for 12 years now. I mean, it's not exactly something wonderful and positive we talk about all the time because we're exposing all of these horrible things that are going on on this planet and the evil cabal and all of the bad, uh, let's say, the entities beyond the realm of uh, a physical manifestation and something else. So, I mean, but we must try to be as positive as we can to make this experience valuable and to play our part in the best way. What makes you think that hate and anger are not positive? Well, we all possess these emotions and we have They're to be emotions, aware of them. Right? They're and emotions emotive. and we but we emotive. possess them. Right? We possess them. And if some if somebody hurts somebody you love or I love, we will uh, act in anger and with uh, aggression, I guess. I mean, you oh, know. they have these emotions have their place. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the most difficult, uh, I've thought about this a lot, obviously, and I don't like to talk, you know, recklessly or carelessly about these things. But the greatest objection that comes up in people's minds uh, is, well, you know, it doesn't feel good. You know, I, I, I don't like to feel angry. Uh, it's a negative. I don't like to feel hatred, you know. And I would say I totally understand that. But what kind of anger and, anger and hatred are you feeling that you judge as negative, that you don't like, you see? And is it possible that you could feel a kind of anger, a kind of rage driving you like a pure blade of anger or that you could feel some kind of hatred which is an absolute defiance against those evil forces that are working on us and that would feel right and exhilarating have you ever considered that possibility yes but don't you feed the demons or the archons or whoever no, is i do not feed you? the archons man you do not where did you get the idea whoever told you that by having these negative emotions you would be feeding the forces that are working against you. Who told you that, man? Oh, m many people did, but it also seems quite obvious that if uh, if they actually can find, let's say, find a home within somebody and possess you in a way, they will feed on aggression and anger and anxiety and fear, most of all fear, because that's what, what is holding the whole world captured in in well, trembling with fear about anything that's going on in the world, even even these days connecting to other people, physically and emotionally. There we have the glasses say, again. <laughs> honestly, uh, I can tell you where I wear these, by the way. I'd like to tell you why. But all I can say is, my psyche don't work that way. I do not feed demons out of the anger that I feel, or the hatred that I feel for those who want to harm life, harm life, destroy life, degenerate and pervert the world. It's not happening accidentally. It's not happening automatically. It's happening because it's a program that's being driven. And when I feel hatred and opposition and defiance and anger toward those beings, I ain't feeding no demons. It doesn't work that way in my psyche. And this is precisely what I'm trying to get at. Oh, lean, my friend. A change of heart. You judge these emotions. You judge yourself. Lay off it, man. It's getting very desperate. And it's getting to the point where there is a, a threshold upon which we stand. And looking back from that threshold, we see humanity in one way, your sense of humanity, the attributes of humanity, what it is to be a good person, 
But looking across that threshold, you see it in a different way. I doesn't see that nice come, people. doesn't that spring from um, our morality of what is good, how it's, how it's, what is the best, how is the best way to be on this planet? What is supposed to be a good balanced way and not the way that the politicians and the bankers and all of these top elitists are trying to to steer us. Isn't this a sign of us having empathy and compassion that we become angry and that we use that also to expose these things, which is the reason why we're even doing this channel. You don't do it for profit. You don't do it because you gain something amazing from it except you know connecting with wonderful people like you and other people and all of the viewers watching but i mean it's still it's something within that wants to change this world so isn't that isn't that a a determination and an ambition to change it and yes we become angry we all do but if if we're being consumed by anger then we're kind of uh, feeding into the whole thing, what, what the elitists want us to to feel, huh? Well, it's a skill. It's the art of war. Do you think that a skillful warrior, a, a samurai warrior, to use that one archetype, uh, is consumed by anger? No, he rides anger like he rides a blade, you know? The idea that you cannot feel anger without being consumed by it is stupid yeah but i guess you can i guess you can but if you 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 talk about anger i mean if you use anger in a positive way that doesn't destroy your own life or it doesn't consume you in your daily lives and your how, how you act towards other people then i guess what you're saying is it's a frequency of uh, trying to um, change the world for the better but using that Aggression. No, I ain't trying to change anything. I ain't trying to change the world. I ain't trying to help anybody. I am here to stand for what I see as truth. To me, it's all about truth. One of the things that makes me the most angry, and perhaps people listening, even though they they don't share my views here, can agree with this. I don't like to be lied to. And I will react to you as a friend and an acquaintance. If you lie to me my, with, to my face, I don't like it. And I don't like politicians lying to me. I don't like philosophers, AI, technocratic nerds lying to me. I don't like to be lied to. I'm only here because I care about the truth. And if my passionate commitment to the truth helps anyone, gives them insight, leads to a better situation then fine but i don't really care all i care about is the truth that i see and the truth that i know that's what i stand for so we're on the same page that way certainly well i hope it's common sense i hope it's common sense because one of the things i wanted to point out if we get back to this idea of uh I, i'd like to leave the listeners with this view that we are living in a time when there is a tremendous, it, it's called dystropic escalation. Actually, the scientific term for it is positive feedback, which is a very bad uh, term, very bad syntax. So when scientists talk about positive feedback, they take an example of like there's a bridge. This happened in Australia, I think. And there's a, there's a bridge which is somewhat mobile. It's hanging on huge cables and a turbulent wind comes through and the bridge, you know, starts to undulate, right? And then it undulates more and more. And then somehow the undulations of it build into bigger undulations and eventually the whole bridge. They call that positive feedback, stupidly. I call it dystropic escalation. It means that things fall apart and they fall into degeneration. So we're not only living at a moment of extreme moral and emotional and mental dystropic escalation, but we're living at a moment of a possibility of syntropic escalation, of a higher re regeneration, a higher arc of regeneration. Both these things are happening at the same time. 
So there's a lot that's going down and there's an opportunity. And that's what I want to talk about. How do we take advantage? How, first of all, how do we see and define what this opportunity for syntropic higher escalation, regeneration of society, of ourselves? How do we define that and how do we get on that wave? So, so in other words, you're also saying in a way, from what I <clears throat> from what I understand you, that we can use the great reset. And we can use this reset coming in a positive way for us to go to another level. And some people say it's the fifth dimension or, or whatever ascension. And other people say it's about, you know, maturing into another parallel in a way, uh, because we have to live on this earth uh, alongside with other people who are simply not on the same wavelength and that we can't communicate with in the same way. So the, this reset can be used for good as well. Is that, where, is that what you mean? Yeah, it's an opportunity. You know, in the last page of my book, Not in This Image, I cite uh, the legend, I guess you could call it that, the information we receive from ancient Hindu texts about Kali Yuga. And they say that Kali Yuga is the age of the most serious degeneration of the human species everything degenerates, everything becomes perverted and sick, right? And the human animal, they say many things about Kali Yuga in the Mahanirvana Tantra, for instance, they say the uh, tension span of the human animal is released, is reduced to 10 seconds or less. You know, they say that all the old forms of spirituality, all the old teachings of the Vedas uh, and all the old practices uh, are obsolete. They don't work anymore. They just become spiritual garbage, spiritual pretenses. They say a lot of brilliant things, but the real message that I draw from that, which is on the last page of my book, is that although Kali Yuga is the age of the most severe degeneration of our species, the opportunities for so-called spiritual development are peak. And not only that, but you can reach the Mahanirvana Tantra says specifically that in the end of Kali Yuga, even though everything is falling apart and degenerating around you, you can reach levels of consciousness and awareness and spiritual power like that, that previously took lifetimes to achieve. I want you to register that, that statement. Practices that re previously took lifetimes to achieve what you can call a level of spiritual attainment, self-empowerment, sovereignty. In Kali Yuga, you can gain that in an instant. And I've always taken that as an extremely uh, wonderful piece of news. And I live by that, and I do that. That's absolutely true and, and, and really amazing. and. People should know and have tools how to tap into this concept of the Kali Yuga and what is going on right now in, in order to 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 do their to to do in the best possible way. But how does that how is that connected to your concept of using hate as an energy source? Because what you just said was really amazing. But I mean, how how does hate uh, fit in here? Well, the Mahanirvana, Maha Nirvana Tantra, which is a Hindu Sanskrit text, it's not Buddhist, okay? Don't confuse it with the Maha Nirvana Sutra. Don't do that. I would never forgive you if you did. So <laughs> I shall try not to. <laughs> you know. So the Maha Nirvana Tantra is a document, rare document of the 11th century, the earliest manuscript, I think, but it contains kind of a summation of what is I consider to be the tantric tradition, which is oral. So the tantric, the true tantric tradition is an oral tradition. It doesn't necessarily belong. It's, an, it's a counterculture underground current. 
So you don't find it in traditional Buddhism. It, it was always sort of underground and it surfaced and I picked up on it. And that's the wave that I serve. I serve the tantric wave. And, and one of the basic principles of so-called tantra, by the way, the word simply means, uh, literally it means tapestry or weave. So if I give you a woven rug, that's a tantra. But it also means it's continuity, flow. Right. So one of the basic principles of the tantric way of life, which I live, is that all emotions are just degrees of intensity. There's no value judgment on them at all. But isn't it most mostly a sexual philosophy between two people holding back and retaining your bodily fluids, so to speak? Oh, don't get me started, man. Please don't get well, me started. I, I, I think I got you started already, didn't I? Uh, you, you're, 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 you're a teaser. Okay, I'll play along. That is complete and utter misdirection. Those teachings from the East, which come from China, Mantak Kia, these other Chinese al sexual alchemists, the Tao of sex, this is all garbage. This all comes from the patriarchy. And this idea that uh, this narcissistic, horrific narcissistic idea that if you retain your own seminal fluids, you reprocess them into the into your body and be, be become uh, you know godlike. Uh, have you done that? And would you report on your progress, sir? I don't certainly do not speak about those things on my own channel here. Please, all I'm, right. I, you're, you're right. Now, I'd like you to continue, please, sir. Well, back to the tantric view of life. The tantric view of life, one, one way that I tried to describe it once is I said that according to the tantra, tantrika, who is someone who just works with power and works with energy, you know, and doesn't judge the energy. I don't judge the energy. I don't judge if it's anger or empathy. What matters is what I do with it, how I direct it. That's what matters. So I can direct tenderness, empathy, kindness. I can direct brutality, cruelty, hatred. And to be a tantrika is to be a master of those intensities. They're just intensities. So one way that I described it, well, fuck, I'll repeat myself. It may not be amusing. Uh, I said to some students years ago, You know, it's like you got a pasta machine. And so you have this, this thing that stands up and then you have this handle, right? And you put the pasta dough into it and it comes out, right? But along with the pasta machine are different settings. So if I, if I put a certain setting in and I put in the pasta and I turn the handle, then it comes out like thin spaghetti. If I put another setting in the pasta machine, then it comes out like, you know, flat, flat noodles, right? That's your emotions. Your emotions are just a pasta machine. That's all they are. They're degrees of bio emotional intensity and do not judge them. Just look at how you use them. You know, a lot of people in the world, I won't say a lot. I don't know how many people in the world have told me that their lives were changed by reading not in his image. And I turned around and I said, yeah, great. And I'll tell you something. I wrote that book in a state of white, cold anger. Every page of that book is written in a state of anger. And yet that book is something that it stands in the world as an expression of knowledge that people have found very transformative, you see. This Just, is a good time for us to actually show the book because I have it right here. Right, and, you do. Uh, and I was thrilled to have this special 15th anniversary edition yes. of your book where you updated it with a lot of information. But I have to say it's also, you know, it's uh, It's big language, a lot of big words. Yeah, I know. And, uh, it takes, you know, it, it, it's not for the weak. You see that? I want to point out something to people. 
When this book came out in the first edition, I had a horrific confrontation with the book designer. Uh, we were sitting on a Zoom conference and we were talking about the cover because this is my cover. I designed this cover. And this is the Iliusus. These, this is the secret of the mysteries, which I talk about a lot in the book. And then I said, okay, I want the pediment of Eleusis to be at the bottom. And then I want a starry background with a kind of a dawn. And then I want the figure of the goddess. And so this woman who was actually in charge of sending the book to, she's the last one who signs off on production and sends it to the printer. We're sitting there in a Zoom conference and she says, uh, well, I don't like those eyes. And I said, what? You don't like the eyes. See, you don't see the eyes on that cover like you see them on this cover. And the reason for that is that the first 2,500 copies she sent to the production company and she changed the cover photo so that it didn't show the eyes of the goddess. Now, well, I certainly think, have it on my copy. You can you can see it here. Yeah, but you can see it even better in this copy. See the difference? Probably, but I think it's still quite visible, though. You can see it, but it's yes. really visible here. And I said to her, look, she said, it's creepy. Eyes in the sky. It's creepy. And I said, look, the whole purpose of my book is to let the world know that the goddess is present. She's looking at you. She is your divine mother. She is the earth. The image of her eyes looking at you is important. And she didn't like that. So she actually made it so that the cover image of the first 2,500 books doesn't show the eyes as clearly as this. And was I angry toward her about that? Yeah, man, I was angry. You see? So anger is just what you get when you put a certain filter into the emotional pasta machine. And like it says in the analogy, what is this thing? What is this thing that you turn the pasta machine with? What's it called? A handle. It's how to it's handle all, it. It's all about how you handle it, my friend. Yeah, it's all about how you handle it. Yeah, but I still yeah. think it's quite visible with those eyes. Maybe she was, uh, maybe she felt a little threatened that this model who was modeling for this picture was so beautiful. She was a feminist. And like most feminists, she's terrified by the true presence of the divine feminine. And you can quote me on that one. Yeah, that's that's a very also very important topic, which I'm we are not afraid to go into here, certainly, because it is part of the political agenda <clears throat> also to separate the sexes at the moment and to and create to create a very weak um, <clears throat> masculine subculture really an imbalanced yeah, really. culture and men that no longer are a allowed in a way to stand in their own light and to be masculine in their own way i'm not talking about being macho or being stupid but to be masculine in your own power the same as being feminine right when we and we possess yeah. both of these uh abilities and these uh what 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 do we even call those traits or those things that we have it's part of all humans to have a masculine side and a feminine side the gender binary and one of the samples one of the glaring screaming examples of the degradation and degeneration is the attack on the gender binary which is insane and yet as you know it's a pretty strong feature in our social environment isn't it it certainly is and it's all over the moment and if you're here in in this country in denmark this is the southern part of scandinavia and in all of scandinavia i think that these these three four countries are the most feminist countries in the world first sweden that are first in everything and then denmark and then pro probably norway and all that so everything always kind of happens first here and uh and it's a highly feminist country, but those are also the ones that complain the most that uh, they don't have equal rights. 
So uh, there's a lot of, um, excuse the expression, soy boys in this country. Well, you're on the front lines, and it's a good place to be in, because the place where the action and the degeneration is worse is the place where it's going to blow up spectacularly in people's faces. And it is blowing up. It is blowing up because it is the program that we've been driven into by the Sabbatean agenda <clears throat> is so anti-human and perverse that it just goes, it just goes against our innate sense of humanity to get back to that theme. Uh, and it's blowing up. The blowback is happening. And you do see signs of that. And I, I find it very encouraging. I mean, look, uh, who likes to be have a total stranger make demands on you? Uh, obviously, like a lot of people. Well, a lot of people like to be steered. It's almost like you, you've seen that certainly in the past three years. And we know what's been going on there. We have seen a lot of people totally rolling over flat on their backs. And, you know, I won't even, well, I won't even continue what I was about to say, but they're certainly ready to have things done to them that, you know, that are, which is extraordinary. And they, they will believe anything and they believe in their masters, so to speak, their, their politicians. And they don't even look outside of their own country to see that it's a total replica happening in all, uh, all other countries. It's absolutely the same formula. And if you look up further up there to see the hidden hand and how everything is connected like an octopus. Uh, steering us, I think it's extraordinary. But people want to, 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 to believe that they're doing something for the greater good of humanity. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I was reflecting on this conversation that we would have, and you know, to be honest with you, I, I thought, oh, I proposed to Lucas this idea of talking about mutation technically speaking in gnostic language it's the mutation of a11 this is the technical language a11 and i thought oh i think i, I you know i might have proposed something that i can't handle here uh and i really started to have some doubts before our meeting today about whether i could skillfully and helpfully even talk about this and uh so i thought and i was aware of the caveats and so forth so i thought I would try something. So can I try something with you? Now, this is going to be safe, right? That depends on what it is. I mean, the... okay. okay. It's, it's, let's just say that there was an event that happened a few years ago, pretty much across the world. And I would call it uh, the blue nose moment. Is that okay? All right. Right. So what happened was that uh, the authorities uh, told a lot of people that they, and demanded and enforced it, that they would wear a blue nose, okay? Like a clown nose, right? Yes, I know. So, but it, it was blue, Yeah, right? Yeah. It was, and it was okay. pretty ugly. And as you, it was very ugly. And as you were just saying, lo and behold, due to the, uh, Thing. the demands, the threats that came down from the authorities, People are putting on the blue nose, okay? We remember the two years of the blue nose. You can we say that? Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, okay. I, I, I haven't tried that one before, but let's hope. <laughs> so I tell you this. There is a great lesson to be learned from that, which is con uh, connected intimately to the notion of the mutation of the anthropos, of the mutation of humanity in the Gnostic framework, which I may or may not get around to, but I'm kind of reticent to talk about it because it's quite complicated. It's and really I, all I, about I, compliance to see where people will go, how far they will take them to take it, and if people will go along with it, right? And um, I mean, this is what we've been talking about so much, and this connects all, also with what is going to happen now with the whole climate thing and with the AI and the implementation of AI yeah. and where yeah. where they want to take our mental capacity, our uh, uh, psyche, and how they want to link us in, uh, physically and 
spiritually, I suppose, and uh, certainly psychologically, to that AI super brain computer. Could it be that this that there's another version of the AI super brain computer that that all of the religions and religious people have have has referred to as God? Um, but maybe it's another type of construct and that we were all created and put on this earth in some kind of a simu that that is like some kind of holographic sophisticated holographic simulation that we're in this computer game that we're being steered that maybe we even chose something if we if we include the, the karma wheel circle of life as well into all of this and uh and that we're being recycled uh, spiritually and uh, and uh, well, not physically, obviously. But uh, could that AI super brain computer be something way above and beyond the Neuralink thing, the Elon Musk thing, and the grid around Earth? Do you think? Can I get fries with that? Are you saying that these are things that people are speculating about and suggesting? Or are you saying that I, Lucas, actually seriously think that there is something true in these things? I rarely uh, speak about what I believe in this channel. That's why we've had the type of shows we've had for so many years with so many different speakers. I ask questions to everybody, critical questions, but I'm with an open heart and an open mind. And I'm interested in all uh, topics and that, that, that there are no limitations to what can actually be possible. So Give me an example. Uh, how would I know? No. Give me an example. How has the impossible become possible? Give me one example. Oh, everything, everything that's been going on in this world and also the, the, the beyond. If you believe that there's something beyond the five senses and the, this three, three dimensional reality that we manifest in, if we believe in that, and we certainly do, that's why we even have this show because we have to think out of that box as well, out of the matrix, out of the Pandora's uh, box and the limitations of 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 what uh, what we understand to be our three-dimensional reality so of course all of that how do we have any evidence that any of that is true except for how we feel how we connect with it how we download it to use a computer term ai God particle, God computer, stimulated reality, chat GTP, open AI, lear language learning machines becoming self-learning, gaining agency, overcoming, surpassing and overcoming human intelligence, and dot, dot, dot. Can I tell you what all that is in my opinion? Yeah. It's a shit test. You know what a shit test is? Maybe people don't know. I, I, cause I don't socialize and I'm not, I'm a lot of tropes and things I miss, but it's a common term in, in urban vernacular, isn't it? What does it mean? I don't know. You tell me, but I, I think oh, I know what you, it means. You think you know. Okay, I'll tell you what I think I know, and then you you tell me. It's like comes out of dating. So you, you hear it arose in the context of dating in bars, right? So there are men and women uh, ling uh, uh, mingling in bars back in the days when heterosexuality was a real thing, right? And so the guys have to come on to the women and the women, of course, always are the, the ones who say yes or no, you know, it's, it's their choice. Right. And so they're testing a guy. So a, a woman is sitting at a bar testing a guy and he will, she will ask him these questions, just not because they're serious questions and she wants a serious answer, but just to check what his character is and how smart he is. And that's my understanding of what's called a shit test. You know, it's something that you do to someone to see how credible and how naive they are. 
That's my, I don't know what your understanding of it is, <clears throat> but that's my understanding. And how will how will you connect it to what we're talking about, whether or not uh, AI actually could be something even greater, not because greater it's in not that sense. It, it's not science, man. Haven't you got on to it yet? It's science fiction. When you hear Elon Musk, when you hear these techno wizards talking about what chat GPT can do and simulation and text to image and text to talk and creating your own avatar. This is not science. It's science fiction. You know that the word singularity is a big deal, right? They're saying with uh, open AI, uh, uh, AI and language learning machines are going to reach singularity, right? And they define that as saying that the AI is going to become autonomous and it's going to be able to make its own decisions and who knows what it will do then, right? That's called the AI singularity. Do you know where that idea comes from? Science fiction. It's like, you know, the War of the Worlds, H.G. Uh, Wells, the, 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 the Martians come down. That's not science, my friend. It's science fiction. But aren't they putting all of that in Hollywood movies in order to program pe people it's predictive programming and then maybe they put uh, green martians in there but i mean it could be a metaphor for something else i mean they always put out something in movies and then later on you see it play out in real life and then you kind of have it in your in the but back it's not going to play out in real life that's the illusion but it's because playing you out saw now. it in a movie you think it's going to play out in real life AI is playing out right now you can even get people if you say you want a specific thing you can uh, ask an AI machine to write it for you and they'll it yeah but what's the point them. what's the point of that you know when you ask chat GTP you say write a thousand word essay on me on the uh uh war and peace by Tolstoy right what are you doing look at what you're doing it's not AI that is overcoming and surpassing intelligence, you're surrendering your intelligence to a machine. You have, you're not learning anything. You're, it teaches you based on a regurgitation of what's fed into it. You know how it works. It's thinking for you. The AI machines are never going to think better than we do. And there are a number of savvy techno uh, critics on the internet who's saying this, they're never going to think better than we do. But if you choose to let them think for you, then I say, be damned. Be damned for whatever you get, for surrendering your own intelligence and the cultivation of your own faculties to be such a lazy ass that you would let a machine think for you. That's the danger. AI in itself can't do anything. It doesn't have hands. It doesn't have legs. It doesn't have weapons. It's just crap code on a, on a screen. It's all it is. So the hype about AI is a shit test. It's a way of testing people to see how gullible they are and how fearful they are. You pointed this out. Oh, I'm so afraid that AI is going to take over my life, you know? To the extent that AI, chat, GPT, and these things are coming into our world, they're doing it not because the AI is enforcing itself upon us. It's because certain interested parties, for various reasons, are enforcing it. An AI machine, a language learning machine, never took a job away from anybody. It's the boss of the company that gave that job to the machine. So don't say that AI, don't scare me. I'm not afraid of AI doing anything. And I agree with, uh, I think I've located like three really savvy code writers, and I call them techno critics, techno skeptics, who are saying, look, they're telling you that chat GPT uh, is close to singularity nowhere close to singularity it's absolutely true what you're what you're saying here and um, i totally 
I totally agree with with that, as I think most people do. But um, looking at our recent history in the past three years and also before that, but we've certainly seen what has been going on in the past three years and how people have been surrendering not only their energy, but also their, let's say, physique to something they have been told, you know, that they had to do. If if most people on, on the earth will also comply to have AI implemented everywhere and will, you know, uh, if all of these things will happen as they, the el top elitists have predicted that uh, it will. Well, that's what the elitists want. That's what the technocrats want. Clear, right? We agree. But is that what you want? Is Certainly that not. You want? That's not what you want. That's not what the probably all of the people watching this uh, want. But uh, but how can we uh, stop that if the majority is all for it and are following whatever is the technological evolution because that's what they're told uh, on television? How can we stop it? Can we stop it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, we can stop it. But in order to stop it, if you're someone like me, and most of the people I know who don't want to see this implemented, and who are uh, sane enough to realize that AI in itself is not going to do anything to us, it's just the people who are pushing it for their agenda, you want to stop it, then you might consider having a change of heart about humanity as a whole. And there are three factors in that change of heart, three specific factors. If you, they're like standards. This is a standard. And if you hold by the standard, you will, as a sovereign person, have the power it takes to resist what is evil and deceitful in the world. But you do not, you will not be able to do it unless you meet these three standards. These are the three standards of the mutation, of the higher mutation. So if you want to be on that beautiful regenerative arc that goes into beauty, cooperation, goes into a world where you don't even have to plead for love because everybody has it at a ground level. They're not arguing about it. Everybody knows that's what makes it work. Everybody knows that's the beauty in which we thrive. If you want to be in that world and in that escalation, you, you elect into the regenerative arc, and you do it by meeting three standards. But you're not going to like what those standards are. I'm pretty sure you won't. It doesn't matter what I like. <laughs> I'll tell you what they are. It matters what you like. Well, thank you very much. It's been a long time since I've had that kind of consideration from anybody. And like it or not, the first one is to overcome the illusion of compassion. The illusion of compassion. I'll give you an example. It's a very common sight, you know, going back quite a few years now. Uh, so refugees are coming from Africa or wherever. They're coming on boats. They're coming off various countries. And they arrive en masse in Europe. And the Swedes and the, the Danes and the Norwegians show up with the big posters and says, uh, refugees welcome. That's the illusion of compassion. That's it. Overcoming the illusion, realizing that a lot of what you feel, a lot of what you've been told makes you a good person is all an illusion and a lie about compassion. And find a sense of compassion that is genuine and authentic, that is not conditioned by what you have been told by your obligation. You're obligated to welcome refugees, you're obligated to be kind, you're obligated to be empathetic. Like, I'm capable of empathy. I mean, you probably might not believe it, but I actually am. But I guarantee you that I am not obligated. 
I'll tell you one of the greatest spiritual lessons I learned in my life. I don't think I've ever said this before on any interview. Uh, I went on a quest in my teens, you know, I'm a veteran of the 60s, and I was looking for a lot of things, you know, truth, God, enlightenment, whatever. But I, you know, I wanted to know about love, about anything else. You brought up love before. And I wanted to know, well, like, what is this thing I'm hearing about? This unconditional love. What What is this unconditional love? Is this something that I can realize? Is it something that, is it a state of mind? Is it emotion? You know, so I'm, I'm fumbling my way on my journey to a realization of unconditional love. And I had it. And I'll tell you what it looks like. So I have the capacity for unconditional love. But I am not obligated to show it to anyone but myself. But what if you have a family, children, no, no, mother, no, father, no, dear no, friends? No, you're not listening. I am obligated in the requirement for having the. Would you like to have the capacity for unconditional love, Lucas? Of would course. you like to have it? Yes, I think Do you I have it. it. Do you have it? Yes. Okay, I have it too. And let me tell you about my experience of it. My experience is that it comes with a requirement. It comes with a responsibility. And the responsibility is that I express and feel it first toward myself. I am not obligated to feel it to anyone else. If I choose to, if I choose to meet a stranger in a cafe, at a train station, I choose to express my capacity for unconditional love to them. I can, but I'm not obligated to. And it doesn't make me a bad person if I don't. But I am required to feel it toward myself. Because if I do not have a foundation of unconditional self-love, there is no foundation for love at all. You see, that's what I learned. Take it or leave it. Very true. And I've never I've never said that before. No, but that's so very, very true. You have to love yourself first. I mean, yeah. to, to to love whatever gifts and of talents course. you have. And actually, this brings me, I know this, I don't know, I don't want to jump too much, but it actually brings me to something that you have said, which I wanted to ask that I wanted to ask you about. Let me just see where if I can find it here. Yeah, quoting quoting you about abilities and abilities that are used properly or unused or abilities that talents that remain unused. And you said, yeah, I can do this. I can do it. Whether it is to write a book or a novel or, or all sorts of other things that people have the talent for, and we all have different talents, but we don't use all of that talent that we might have and uh, a lot of people are at the end of their lives might sit there and say why why wasn't i brave enough or courageous enough or why didn't i use this or maybe they're not even aware of this and you say yeah i can do it and then you say but why but you didn't do it why didn't you do it and what what i mean it's true for so many why do you think that we don't use all of the the abilities that we have what you're quoting is from a YouTube talk called Crossing the Threshold of Cruelty. And I'm glad you brought it up because there are three criteria for being in the regenerative mutation of humanity. And that is the third one. The first one is to make sure that you're not operating out of illusions and obligations of compassion. That you're operating out of genuine compassion, because there are many illusions of compassion. Uh, you think you're a good person? That's an illusion of compassion. You know, I don't think I'm a good person. I don't know if I'm a good person or not. Honestly, it never crosses my mind. All I do is behave toward people. And whether I'm a good person or not is going to be manifested in my behavior. But I don't have a preconception. 
I don't have a need to be viewed as a good person. Do you? And then you go on. <laughs> let me let me answer your question. You quote very well, but it's not the point of that. The point of that talk, crossing the threshold of cruelty, was yeah. Uh, you could have done many things in your life and you didn't do them. So you get to the end of your life and like, oh, you know, what do you make of it, right? And you very uh, appropriately ask the question, well, what deterred you? I use the word deterred. What deterred you from writing a novel? What deterred you from going to Bali? What deterred you from, from learning flamenco dance, right? And that has to do with many things. I think that there are basically two things that deter people from doing what they really want to do to, to, you know, we have all talents, all different kinds of talents. How come you don't get to fulfill them? Two things. One is that they don't have the confidence and self-love that gives them the determination to do it. That has to be a determination, right? And uh, one of the great uh, afflictions of Kali Yuga is the the devastation of self-love you see that everywhere you know we're not going to go to the tra and s phenomena but that's all about self-love and the lack of it you know so the first deterrent i think is not having the confidence that comes from self-love and a total passion and belief in yourself but the other thing is circumstances man circumstances today for a true artist, for a genuine singer or dancer, are horrific. What opportunities do they have? Look at what gets attention. I learned when I was 16 years old, I made the observation, not everything that gets attention deserves it. <laughs> and so you're a beautiful, talented person. You can paint beautifully, but how can you get the attention you need? So there are tremendous obstacles to creativity and creative fulfillment in our time. And that's how I would answer that question. But that was not the point of my talk. No, but I think it's a very, very good point, and it stood out to me because I think because it's it's from the human side, and it's the human in us communicating here. And I think this is true for everybody. A lot of people use their maybe their full potential. But a lot, a lot of people are holding themselves back. And I think this is something that everybody, everybody watching this uh, now and later and also just in general, they know about things that are holding them back. You know, things that could yeah. be to come into fruition and to be something great if they actually dare to do it, if they had the confidence to do one it, of the or great, of course the uh, circumstances, yes. Yeah, one of, circumstances. One of the great tragedies of our time is that there are so many young and gifted people. I mean, they're just full of talent in the arts and the sciences, but the circumstances are so bad. It's not like, you know, when I was in, in high school, uh, whatever my talents or skills were, I had a myriad of circumstances where I could go, door, doors that were open for me to go to. And as you know, this is a great, great tragedy because the human spirit uh, uh, longs and hungers to express itself in beauty and creativity. And uh, that's, we're in a war zone, man. We're, you know, we're in a war zone. We got to fight for the ground where we can have that back. You but say. the concept of the American dream, so to speak, is to come from nothing, maybe from poverty and from a bad, bad circumstances, and then become a great success, whether it's in the entertainment field or just in business or in, in, in any kind of field, really, where you make a mark on your community or people around you and certainly your family and, and friends. Uh, isn't that what that concept yeah, it, is all about? You can call it the American dream. It's just the human dream. You know, you want to be everything that you are. And at the same time, uh, however that affects other people, impacts them, you know, for their betterment, inspires them, uplifts them. You know, that's all I do. I just want to inspire, give people insight. And I would do it anyway. I would do what I do anyway if nobody ever listened to me, if nobody ever read my book. 
I would still do it. That's the beauty of it. You do it as a sovereign act, and then you watch and see if others pick up and receive it. And of course, that's great if they do, but that's not why you do it. You do it because you got it in you to do. Uh, and uh, so, yes, we agree on that pretty well. So deterrence, is, is that both connected to failure and also cause and effect? and intention, what we've talked about before, law, law of attraction, law of manifestation, in a way? No, it's a moral dynamic. So without getting too complicated, let me tell the listeners what the takeaway of was that talk, crossing the threshold of cruelty, because this is the third criterion. So the first criterion is you master and overcome illusions of compassion. That means that you're left with real compassion, which probably won't look anything like you were told it is. Okay. The second criterion, I'll just throw it in briefly, is called inclusion. No inclusion. The compassion of the future is not inclusive, it's exclusive. So there is something called the freedom of association. You ever heard of that? I exercise the freedom of association. I don't hang around with crack dealers. I don't hang around with the World Economic Forum. I don't hang around with belly dancers. Belly dancers? No, sorry. <laughs> sorry <laughs> about that one. What, I know what, you're why, should, I know. <laughs> why shouldn't you hang out with belly dancers? Or, or why would you even do it in the first place? Well, a lot of people like belly dancing. They think it's an art form. Well, I, I guess it, it is an art form. Are, are you able to do it? I don't think you can. Or maybe you can. Yeah, but I don't associate with that. So freedom of association becomes a sovereign responsibility. It's not a right. It's a responsibility to say, oh, I don't associate with those people. That's one criteria. And the last one is called crossing the threshold of cruelty. And this is where the idea of deterrence comes in. You asked the question before, and. Let's see if we can if, if we can bring our conversation around to this focus, because I think we can all come together on this one. What can we do to stop those who intend harm, who deceive, who mislead, who exercise authority to dominate and destroy the lives of other people, who who threaten people into wearing blue noses, you know? What, and their whole agenda, and their whole agenda is out in the open. You don't have to go look for it. It's not hidden, is it, Is it, Lucas? No, you could, couldn't be out more open. out in the open. I mean, it's extraordinary that, uh, you know, I don't even know why people can't see it. It's so obvious that it's right in your face, smacked <clears> in your face. It right? is. And so, and in many ways, I think you'd agree, especially with the blue nose phenomenon, uh, come on, they're overplaying their hand now. They're all of it. This. It's all of it. I mean, it's it's it, it's they're taking it to the extreme right now, don't they? So if you want to stand against them, then you need to find your own extreme. And I can tell you exactly where that extreme is. There's a line in the sand and there's a threshold of cruelty. And it goes like this. Oh, I see. Uh, I live in the world, and uh, let's just let me just put it in first-person terms. Uh, have people been cruel to me in my life? Cruel to me, hurtful, abusive, harmful? Yes, I have. Mainly women. Okay. Have I been in physical danger? Have people have actually threatened my life? Yes, I have. Been attacked by. Latinos, actually, on two occasions, which is a sad affair since I really, I really love Latinos. I have great affection for them, having grown up in New Mexico. Uh, and you okay. live in Spain now. You're in Spain. Yeah, I live right? in Spain. I do. 
And so, and do I perceive not only in these immediate personal cases where cruelty uh, and harm are coming to me, do I perceive it coming from the world at large? You bet I do. I see agencies, I see protocols, I see programs, I see agendas, and those people who are pushing all that are not, you know, they intend to harm me, okay? Can you admit that there are people in the world who intend to harm you? Obviously, that's the whole agenda right now, to get full control and total domination over, well, people and souls, I suppose. And do you, in turn, intend to harm them? Now, I would like to uh, uh, counter-ask you that question uh, to steer the conversation back to you in any possible way i can if i'm given them the, i have the motive to harm them you know i go by a rule no harm intended except to those who intend harm now that is a very common sense rule if i'm walking home from town one day and i meet a couple of guys on the street and I see from their posture and their language that they intend to harm me, I intend to harm them in turn, okay? That's common sense. And, it, and that common sense projects onto the global scale. So, yes, if I have the, the you know, motive means an opportunity. If I have the means and opportunity to harm them, I would certainly do so. Not only would I do it, I would do it with great pleasure, and I would do it to the extent of lethal force if I had the opportunity. That's the threshold of cruelty. Now, I'm not saying anyone has to be like me. I'm not setting myself up as an example because I'm not a good example of anything except maybe a crazed shaman, romantic, desperado whatever I am, I don't set myself up as a model, but I'm just telling you, heart to heart, I stepped across that threshold. And I am willing and I intend harm against those who do harm. But there are many, there are many objections and uh, reservations about stepping across that threshold. And I'm saying to you, it may be necessary to look at your objections and overcome them in order to take a stand on the battleground of Kali's cremation field. Because that's but would you also say all of these, these things if you were starting out today and if you were really young and you had discovered all of these things and you had a long life ahead of you? I mean, the, this could jeopardize your own uh, freedom and safety in a way, right? No. Your freedom and safety is already in jeopardy. It's better to act, you say, even uh, no, no matter what it takes. No, you have. I'm not reckless, man. I'm not reckless. And I would certainly look at the question of, can I get away with it? Hey, don't get me wrong. Uh, of course, there are consequences. I mean, there are consequences today if you misgender someone. This is the world that we're living in. How yeah. are you going to stand up to that? Yeah, All I I'm don't, saying, I don't know. I'm going to calm myself down now. All I'm saying is, it looks to me, from the depths of my realization at my advanced age of senile dementia, <laughs> it looks... <laughs> I, don't it think, looks I don't think so yet. doesn't seem like that for sure. Me, like, unless you are... And this is the point I make in the talk on the threshold of cruelty. It's not that you will necessarily have ever to do it. You might not necessarily ever be in the situation existentially where you can harm someone who is harmful and evil and hateful and wrong. But you, but the have the will to do it, that's what matters. Because those human animals now who carry that will in their hearts and bodies, exert a deterrent force against the perpetrators. 
because the only thing that can stop them is the threat of lethal force. The power of intention, the frequency of intention, is that enough, you think? Is that is that a good way to, to start? I'm telling you that it's the game changer. It's the game changer. So that is the law of, the of manifestation and the law of attraction. No, law of conduction. We're going to have to have a fight over this one, okay? Anyway. Rather have a glass of something. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, but you're also, this, right. this, uh, this is, um, this reminds me of what David Icke said once that if you could, if like say four or five percent of the world's population woke up, it would change the reality of the whole planet and, and the the whole system would crumble in the way that we know it because of the the, the collect uh, the collective consciousness would change and that doesn't even seem to be a lot right i mean four or five percent i don't know specific, specific no. about percent but he's absolutely right it's a quantum phenomenon it's not a qualitative phenomenon so if there is a quantum and i would add this by the way which i consider to be a really positive note you know in my opinion there is already quite likely an inestimable inestimable number of people who already feel this way against the perpetrators you know maybe don't we all feel them. that way i mean don't don't we all i mean everybody watching don't don't we feel that way all of us basically no no you feel that way people feel that way up to the point where it where it comes and it says yeah but in a real existential situation, would you be cruel? Would you harm? Would you kill? That's where they stop. They will not cross that boundary. What I'm saying is very precise. I ask you to consider the nuance. If you're listening to me and you're willing to step across that boundary and say, yeah, I hold the sovereign intent to take them down by any means possible, then you become part of a deterrent force. And they feel that. They feel that. They feel the threat. It's all about threat and what's behind the threat. Look at how they threaten us. Everything is threat every day. Everything is threat. There has to be a reciprocal threat to counterbalance that. And the reciprocal threat, that is the new moral courage that changes the whole game. And it doesn't take a lot of people. It doesn't take a huge percentage of uh, the population to change the game. What I call changing the odds of the game. Changing the odds. So they actually also need our approval to to implement AI in the way that they want in the future and that they're already doing that now, which is going against natural law, right? So if we use, so so they need our approval in the way, um, or do you think they're just gonna do that anyway without our approval because they oh, kind of- They don't us, need our approval. That's a bullshit con. That came up many years ago. It's called the revelation of the method. And that is a con. That is not true. It is not actually based on any system of esotericism I've ever studied. But the, it's not that. It's a shit test, man. It's just the putting it out there to see how stupid and naive you are and how compliant you are. They don't need your approval to do anything. They're going to do what they but do. But if people don't money. stand up and say, no, huh? we don't want this. This is against natural law. If you don't even know about natural law, then at least it's against uh, human uh, integrity in, in any kind of way. We don't want this. So they, um, but if people don't even ask those questions or they don't even get to that point, then they do get the approval, right? And then they can do it. But if we all went against it and everybody understood how, how dangerous this is and how, how it could totally degenerate to use that term, the whole, the whole system and society and the human population, then, you know, they, they, they could not move along with it. Right. And implement it in the way that they want. I strongly advise to use the word deterrence. Ask yourself, 
how can I, as just an individual, an ordinary person with what I know about the game of evil, the strategies of evil and deceit, how can I deter the enemies of light? You can only do it by a threat that you are willing to back up. That's a law of nature. And I'll tell you someone who knew that really, really well. I'll tell you some people, some heroic people in the 20th century who knew that really, really well. And they stood up to the greatest, most evil threat on this planet, which is Bolshevik communism. And they knew that they had to have in them the moral force to deter communism. And I won't say who those people were, that nation. I'll just let you infer who they might have been. I would love it if you would uh, say what nation that is, that was. That's the nation of the German people. A great heroic race of romantic dreamers who had the courage to put their whole life and population on the line to fight. What? What were they fighting? They were fighting Bolshevik Russia. They were fighting communism. With fascism, through fascism and Nazism and, and uh, complete similar cruelty. They were fighting communism with the same thing that you and I have to fight it with. Moral with the same thing. They're, they're, it's the same thing. Com communism in the way that it was used uh, against people, not not the, the, the real philosophy like what Karl Marx said, right? Well, the But real I mean, philosophy of communism is a good thing. Huh? The real philosophy of communism is, is a good thing. How come you can even go into that even into that territory and talk about how Nazism was uh, put to good use in a way? I didn't talk about Nazism. Nazism is a racial slur. Fascism. The word. It's the N word. I talked about the spirit, the warrior spirit of the German people. But it was the same thing. No, it wasn't. It was terrorizing the population. Where did you hear that story? Where did I hear that story about yeah. fascism and what happened in Germany in the yeah. in the 30s and the 40s? Where did you hear that story? Not only did we see the images and we saw the films, yeah. but we also yeah. heard it from generations in our families and people that were uh, in concentration camps. So you heard it, you got it from movies? No, you hear it from family members. Okay, and, got it from and, 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 no. and, and real films taken back then. Oh, real documentary films, right? So when you have a real documentary film, for instance, and it shows you like all these bodies, right? That's the film, right? You've seen that, right? All these dead bodies. And then there's something called, what is it called? The voiceover, right? So you see the film, and then there's the voiceover, right? And the voiceover is telling you what you're seeing in the film, right? Well, when Hitler is standing there shouting, it's not a voiceover. Yeah, but what's he saying? And when what's thousands are doing the hailing. Yes, and what are they hailing? What are they celebrating? I mean, to even get to, to that many people to comply, that's always been the big question. How could so many people comply to something that obviously uh, uh, crazy and a madman, uh, whether or not he was a Rothschild, whether or not he was staged, whether or not he was an actor, this was still what was happening. People was there witnessing <coughs> this. I've even spoken to people who lived at that time. Right, and, but and I how could we get people to do not that? Reliable. Huh? I wish since testimony is not reliable. If eyewitness testimony were reliable, this is something that we know in criminology, then there was the Nuremberg tribunals, right? The Nuremberg trials. And one of the things in the Nuremberg trials was, well, there were criminals and we're trying them for the horror of the Holocaust. So you would think 
uh, a reasonable person would think that in the course of the Nuremberg trials, they would bring forth eyewitnesses to attest to the uh, horrors of the Holocaust in the trial, right? Doesn't that sound reasonable? It sounds uh, very reasonable, and that's also what they did in some kind of way. But whether or not history was exactly what they told us or was a different number, that is op that is up for debate, and it's uh, it's an interesting and very, of course, controversial discussion. It is very, uh, much, discussion. Up for it is very much up for debate. Very much up for debate. Yeah, but it, not that it happened. That I... Not that the war happened. And uh, we we all we also talked about who actually backed it financially, which we also know probably from the city of London and and the the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and all of that were probably maybe part of also backing the war financially and create and creating all of that. But even if all of that was part of the new world order structure and done purposely to, uh, let's say, change the whole worldview and do a collective mind control on people and to let's say, save a certain race also uh, for generations to come, then it still was it was still something that happened. It still killed so many people and so many lives were uh, devastated and and because of this world war two. We all know this. I mean that that's not rocket science. I don't know that. You don't know that this know happened that that, because... that that all of that happened even if it's that number or not let me ask you this question if you don't believe the authorities and what they said about wearing the blue nose if you don't believe the authorities in what they said about climate change if you don't believe the authorities in what they said about a great number of things then why would you believe the authorities in what they say about world war ii because families were devastated because of this they were it was in, it was a personal tragedy for a lot of people we also have it in, in our family i mean people that saw the germans saw the soldiers we were under um we were also under siege here and well i mean and and the whole war that went on in the 40s so that's war it's war that's what happens in war yeah, it's a political game. We all, I so we totally agree on that. But to to say that it, all of that didn't exist and a lot of people didn't lose an, an enormous number didn't lose their lives and their homes. Did I say that? Did I say that didn't exist? Did I say that didn't happen? Do do clear up though what you actually mean and what you are saying about it. Okay, I'll say this: if two things. If you want to know what really happened, who caused World War II, who caused World War I, if you want to know the facts, then go read the books that tell you about the primary sources. Go to the primary sources. Go to historical revision. Because all the other books written about World War II are simply repeating a narrative that is not bad based on fact. So if you want to know what you're really looking at, when you see the photograph of all those bodies, if you want to know what that is a photograph of and why those people are there, you have to go and do the work to find it out because the official narrative of World War II is an enormous lie. Yeah, okay? a lot of people say that uh, uh, many people died of typhus and and lots of things. That was what they died of. It's yeah. not a rumor. It's no, no, no. I, I know, I know all about that. But also, and that that the whole thing was orchestrated, and and the same people perpetrators and the orchestrators of the new world order, and their long term plan, which is playing out now. Of course, were had a major um, thing to do with creating World War One and Two and all of that. Certainly, definitely. But a lot of it's just that. A lot of people are losing their lives. A lot of people are going along with the political narrative, standing there hailing. And now these days we can see why a lot of people will comply if it's the the, the official narrative and nobody dares to be the outsider. Well, what, was, what was the official narrative? What did they comply on? You see, you say, 
People they wanted a savior. They wanted a savior, and they no, wanted they, uh, they wanted they jobs wanted their and a better life. They, they wanted their country life. and their nation and their person and their identity of their people. That's what they wanted, and that's what they got. And then they had to defend it because there was an enemy who wanted to destroy them. So all I'm saying, I'm not talking about the Nazi regime. I don't use the word Nazi. It's it, it's as bad as the N word. It's a horrific racial slur to use that word, okay? That people, that nation exemplify a warrior courage. That's all I'm saying. But supposedly they didn't lose the war. They won the war. How did they win the war? The Germans. Not the Germans. The Germans were just part of it. It's all part of the New World Order plan. It's well, all it's all a, it's all a Hegelian dialectic uh, strategy, yeah. right? Splitting, divide and conquer to believe that there are Germans and there are other Europeans and Americans and all of that is there. They are working for their own greater cause, which is to implement the New World Order and everything we're seeing today. And then they created the Cold War. And now again, they're using Russia as a threat. And we see that with the Ukrainian crisis and all of that also a staged uh, crisis, huh? I respectfully disagree. And I disagree oh. profoundly with what you're saying. Oh, wow. That That's scenario, I'm familiar with that scenario. David Icke is one of the architects of that scenario. It's all the same thing, you know, World War I, World War II. I totally disagree with that. How can I you do. disagree? Because you can see the impact. You can see uh, what is happening. You can see how the puzzle pieces fit together. You can see what's happening now. You can see the situation we're discussing, where we are now in 2023. And it's not a very good uh, place to be, is it? How can I disagree? Uh, not his image came out, but in 2006, I don't read books anymore. I don't read anymore because there's not much that I care to learn or there's not many books that can show me. But I've spent, what, the last 15 years studying what's called historical revision, historical review. And that means that you look at the official narratives and conspiracy theories like the one you're talking about, and you go back to the original sources and look at what actually happened. You go read the original documents. You look at what they actually said. For instance, you look at what the leaders of the National Socialist Workers Party actually said about their agenda, about their mission, and you go and look at what they said about themselves, not what other people said about them. And in 15 years of studying these things, I don't claim to be infallible. I don't claim to be uh, even right. But I stand on a completely different basis from you in evaluating this uh, these events. But that is your privilege to have a different point of view. I'm just saying how all the puzzle pieces are fitting together. It totally fits into this bigger narrative of implementing the new world order, a one totalitarian, one world government. Which but who is behind right the now. new world order? Was Same it the people. Who's the, behind the new world order? Did Hitler want to create the new world order? The same bloodlines that has always been behind it and that's not proven and i can show you scholars who say that is not true you have to look at both sides of the argument there are scholars that have looked at that seriously taken that claim very seriously has nothing to do with bloodlines but where are they scholars i mean where who are they part of uh are they or, or staged or are they um acclaimed official scholars that are allowed to to speak on television for example no, because those scholars merely repeat the official narrative lie. The scholars I'm talking about are like me. You think anyone pays me any money for what I do? I would have written not in this image if no one ever paid me. They are independent scholars. They speak German. They've been to the places. They've talked to eyewitnesses who are in the German forces. Those kind of people are the people who present another side of the story. And I've had the benefit of the last 15 years of listening to them. 
No, they are not allowed on public platforms. So who do you think is behind the orchestration of the New World Order to create a one world government? Like the WEF and things like that. World but they were all they're all from the old Nazi regime. I mean, they're no, they're, they're part not. of that whole thing. They're not from the Nazi regime, and that information is incorrect. You're just listen. You're uncritically accepting things that you've heard. Kissinger and Klaus Schwab, which yeah. who, and he was Klaus they're Schwab. Not German. Klaus hey, Schwab's mentor was Kissinger. Up. What is the ethnicity of Henry Kissinger? It's okay. You don't have to say it. Okay, this is a great conversation. I hope people are enjoying this and getting their teeth into this. And we've really gotten our teeth into some things here. And I think we can, in an amiable manner, say, you know, we agree to disagree on certain fundamental matters. Yeah, but that's very important. And that's very good. Uh, and your take is valuable and very fascinating and uh, will interest a lot of people. So that's just absolutely wonderful. And I want to ask you about what you really know a lot about, which is uh, Gnosticism, because a lot of people think that the Gnostics have had a specific worldview or universal understanding, but you interpret it at and their ideology quite differently, uh, don't you? The greatest lie that is... Uh been taught about the Gnostics or told is that they rejected the material world and they said that the material world was a product of an evil demiurge, an evil deity, and that we are trapped in a matrix. Uh, we are divine sparks trapped in a dark matrix of materiality. That is not true. And I explained that that is the straw man argument. It's, it's not what the Gnostics themselves said. It's what their enemies, the church fathers, said that the Gnostics said. So I dedicated that whole talk with him to that, answering that question. Oh, so wow. But can we just go a little bit into it here? Because we haven't we haven't had that discussion. But I mean, I'm just because a lot of people would say that is what you're saying, right? I mean, don't, don't a lot of people think that? What I'm saying about what the Gnostics really believed or taught uh, I take from their words. That's what not in his image shows. It destroys the straw man argument. And it shows what they really, what their cosmological texts really say. The greatest misconception, which is a lie, is that they condemned the material world. They condemned the natural world. They said it was not created by the true divine benevolent God. It was created by a satanic deity and we are all trapped in the satanic matrix. They never said that. But wouldn't you say that we are trapped in a satanic matrix in a way and controlled maybe by the, the influence of Saturn? No, I'm not controlled. I'm not in a satanic matrix, are you? I'm in nature, nature. Do you know what nature is? The Gnostics taught that what you call nature is the divine body of a goddess. And that was the central figure in their view, in their cosmology. That's what I live. I live in the, in the paradise of the divine feminine matrix. I live in her womb. That's the matrix. I live in. And that's where the Gnostics live. And I learned from them how to live there and how to recognize the beauty of nature. The Christian enemies of the Gnostics claimed that the Gnostics hated nature. They condemned it. But if you go and look, as I did, through every single Coptic manuscript and every single line and dig out what they actually said, it's not at all what you're being told. Would you say that Gnosticism and Gnosis really is a form of clairvoyance, intuition, God feeling, a kind of a download of frequency from another plane beyond vision? 
No, it's noetics. It's the training of your mind and your cognitive faculties to their highest optimal possibility. It's the training of common sense and probity and the observation of nature. It's the training of the intellect. And it is true that if you can train the intellect really skillfully, there is a certain place where the intellect breaks into the paranormal and breaks into the mystical. There is nothing irrational about the supernatural and the mystical. Nothing. But you have to have the skill, the cognitive skill to evaluate those supernatural and mystical experiences correctly. So Gnosis is nothing but the practice of learning how to use your mind in the way it is designed to be used. And in order to do that, it is extremely helpful to know who designed your fucking mind in the first place. And if you know that, you're a Gnostic. I think uh, if you're up for it, we could do another um, episode at some point and go into other topics because we only just, as I just said, scratched the surface. I don't know if you want to hit us with something extremely controversial to end with again this time or if you have some thoughts to share maybe a, maybe a positive thing to to give the audience here in our remaining moments well thank you for bringing that up in addition to correcting the misconceptions and lies about the gnostic movement and the gnostic mysteries the mysteries the other great gift of insight that comes from gnosticism is that they warned us about the archons and so the gnostic intel on the archons is something very special it's in a special frame you can't just blow off one way or the other in your mind and say archons this archons that there is a rigor to understand what they meant by the archons but the takeaway is that they identified the root of evil on this planet they identified the human proxies to the archons and this is an incomparable gift of knowledge that you do not find in any other metaphysical or spiritual teaching. So I strongly advise those who look into my book and investigate it to beware that you will find that there. The root of transhumanism, of technocracy, of the madness of AI, of the madness of the medical tyranny, medical industrial complex, Every aspect of the assault on humanity today comes from a source that they identified, and no other spiritual teaching has ever done that. That's my last word. So I wish I had a joke to end on, but uh, that'll have to do for now. And sure, I'll get together with you anytime. Uh, you know, it reminds me of, our, of our being in Argentina. I've never been there. But you know, the tango is a great, you know, it was a very sexy dance, right? The way that, you know, that, but did you know that the tango was a dance that originated in the bordellos of Argentina? No, I actually didn't know that, but it's a fascinating yeah. dance to dance. And hold on, because the punchline is coming. <laughs> and originally, it was two men that danced the tango, sort of like we do. And why, why did they do that? It's because it was a competition dance. So in the bordello, the women sat around and then the men came in and the better dancer of the tango got the women. That's how actually it originated. So I sort of look at our scene in that way. I mean, what you and I do is it's a real tango between two men and it's brilliant. And I do really wish that those who listen can draw the best from what comes but what happens between us that's it's, my wish it takes two to tango and we certainly know how to do it and i also hope that people will take something really great from this uh ping pong and uh, and discussion which it became uh, more so than just an interview so uh I'll be really happy and glad to invite you back on our show because it's always uh, extremely fascinating and probably even more fascinating uh, 
like this. So it's a privilege. Uh, and I think that something in our crazy combination, you know, it's that's absolutely crazy what happens between us. Yeah. But I, I something know. in it allows things to break through. And that's that's really what matters. And I think there's a hunger that people have for that. So we're we're doing good. I feel that and I hope one day we can meet face to face. That would be wonderful. Also just to end here with your book, people can still buy not in his image, the 15th anniversary edition. How can they purchase it? Oh, the usual, if you're in America, you get it through my publisher, I prefer, but you know, you have to just go, if you don't go to a bookstore, just the usual channels. Okay. And your website, can you say that? Yeah, my website is an online university for the restoration of the humanities and the preservation of the pagan mysteries. And it's called <laughs> Nemeta, N-E-M-E-T-A dot org. There's a lot of free material on it. So look, it's, it's been a kick. Absolutely. I want to thank you, John Lamb Lash, for once more <laughs> gracing us with your presence here, your fascinating <laughs> presence here on Age of Truth TV. Thank you so much. See you the next time. Thank you very much for that fascinating tango, John Lamb Lash. And thanks to all of you for watching Age of Truth TV. You can support us by clicking on to our website, ageoftruth.tv. And please like our videos, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell for notifications. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website, ageoftruth.tv as well. Please also subscribe to our alternative channels on BitChute and Brighton. Your support is greatly appreciated and very needed. On behalf of the Age of Truth TV team, we thank you so much for watching and we'll see you again soon.